Hi, my name is Tracy Linera. I am an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Connecticut. I have a new article in Hypatia titled The Misogyny Paradox in the Alt-Right, where I offer a philosophical analysis of the misogyny women experience in the alternative right movement. I argue that this misogyny takes on a paradoxical form. It goes something like this. The better alt-right women propagandists promote hate, the greater the hostility they experience from their fellow racists and critics. The more submissive women alt-right members become, the harsher the impact of misogyny on them. Now, I'm going to talk more about my work with the help of the arguments of some fantastic feminist philosophers and gender and terrorism scholars. And hopefully, if you're watching this, this spiel might entice you to read the whole piece, which is really a behemoth of an article at 11,000 words. To begin, what is the alternative right movement? The alt-right movement is a spectrum of extremist groups espousing a mix of racism, nationalism, and far-right populism. Its members are mostly white and male, recruited from Reddit, Twitter, and 4chan and 8chan's politically incorrect discussion boards. Alt-right groups include the Proud Boys, Turning Point USA, and the Traditionalist Worker Party which are connected to the more established racist organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan and Aryan Nations. So in contrast to the hostile, estranging image of older racist groups, the tech-savvy alt-right takes a strategic, neighborly approach, aiming to make racism palatable to an already politely racist audience. Violence is an alt-right norm. In 2020 alone, far-right groups were responsible for over 67% of domestic terror attacks in the U.S. The alt-right is also deeply misogynistic, claiming that women's autonomy is a threat to Western civilization. It sees mixed-race partnerships, sexual freedom of women, and the fear that non-whites are procreating at a far higher rate today as pressing global issues. The alt-right also uses anti-feminist rhetoric for online recruitment, saying things like feminists are at fault for emasculating men. That can be especially effective in luring alienated recruits. And if this misogyny bait is successful, recruiters then introduce targets to other toxic views, such as their hatred of immigrants of color, liberals, Jews, Black Lives Matter, and the Antifa. In terms of crimes against women, alt-right members have been documented to mistreat their mothers, girlfriends, and wives. Richard Spencer, for instance, was accused by his ex-wife of marital abuse. White terrorists Richard Poflovsky and Matthew Heimbach have been charged or implicated in cases of domestic violence. Of course, these cases are hardly surprising to feminists. Misogyny and racism are not independent forces in Western patriarchal cultures. Acting in concert, they undergird the dominant social hierarchy where the straight cisgender white man is king. But what may strike us irrational is why white women today join and support the alt-right. Why would these women celebrate a movement whose foundations are rooted in its power to oppress them? An analysis of women embracing racist ideology has been given scant attention in philosophy, with the exception of Ellie Pereira's essay on internalized misogyny, Andrea Dworkin's right-wing women, and the works of Black scholars Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, and Patricia Hill Collins. Even less examined, and with good reason, is the misogyny that racist white women experience. I attend to this overlooked task in my article. I examine the pernicious role of women, propagandists like Lana Lochtef, Ayla Stewart, and Lauren Southern, who frame the alt-right as supportive of white women's interests. Lochtef is an American white supremacist and host of the podcast Radio 314. Stewart is an American religious blogger behind the now defunct Wife with a Purpose. And Southern is a Canadian white nationalist and alt-right YouTube celebrity. 
All three of them endorse the white woman's devotion to the nurturing of the white racial family. But while they are guilty of perpetuating misogyny online, they are also its victims. These propagandists receive all forms of toxic abuse, including rape and murder threats from critics and from even from outright members themselves. One reason they are criticized is because of their hypervisibility. Instead of staying at home and acting womanly and raising more white babies, as domesticated racist women are expected to do, they are earning lucratively from their propaganda and they are also playing visible, influential, and powerful roles as women in the movement. And of course, some alt-right men just can't handle that power wielded by women. But even when alt-right women play the role of good racist girls and conform to traditional feminine norms, they also experience violence and abuse from alt-right men. Sayward Darby's book, Sisters in Hate, narrates the story of Corrine Olsen, who recalls feeling welcomed in her first neo-Nazi picnic in Oregon for being a white mother. But misogyny then reared its horns toward her vulnerable kin, her daughters, sexualized by alt-right men who saw them as fair game. Harold Covington, founder of the Northwest Front, once insisted that, and I quote, she bring her daughters to their office so that he could put eyes on two Aryan girls. The thought of an aging man sizing up her daughters made her sick to her stomach, end of quote. An ex-member of Identity Europa, now known as the American Identity Movement, recalled that when she joined the group, she, and I quote, brought dresses with full skirts and nipped in waists, clothes with which she wanted to project an all-American delicate sensuality, end of quote. But this did not protect her from being taunted with jokes that go, and I quote, since white women are ruining Western civilization through promiscuity and voting for liberals, the only way to save it is to impose Sharia law on women and in the supremacist twisted view of Sharia, treat them like property, end of quote. So how can we make better sense of what's going on with the lives of these racist women in white supremacist groups? In my essay, I explain what I call the misogyny paradox in the alternative right movement in three parts. First, I begin by exploring the racist white women as an imagined subject. In her work on social imaginaries, Louise Richardson self identifies the imagined subject as the preformed and creatively developed identity of people in a social group. Three images of white women abound in racist propaganda following Kathleen Lee, the goddess victim, the wife and mother, and the female activist. I take these three images as expressions of the white woman's imagined subjectivity in the social imaginary of white supremacy. These traditional images undergird the more popular alt-right images of the white power Barbie and the trad wife. Lauren Southern, who began her career by making anti-feminist commentary, is an example of a white power Barbie. She would usually package her lifestyle videos as skincare routines or makeup tutorials, using her blonde Barbie-like appearance to lure unsuspecting viewers. Before launching into an anti-Islam tirade or a conspiracy theory about immigrants abusing Swedish women, Utah-based Ayla Stewart identifies as a trad wife. She links feminism to the deterioration of the Western civilization, the core of which is the white nuclear family, making her and people who venerate the vision of 1950s American family life with misplaced nostalgia natural allies of the alt-right, following Sayward Darby. Second, I get to the heart of the article and analyze the paradoxical character of the misogyny experienced by alt-right women. Again, it goes something like this. The better alt-right women propagandists promote hate, the greater hostility they experience from their fellow racists and critics. The more submissive women alt-right members become, the harsher the impact of misogyny on them. So how does this all work? 
So I argue in the paper that the success of women alt-right propagandists requires the acquisition and display of what Kate Mann calls masculine-coded goods, turning them into regular targets of misogyny. Patriarchal societies, according to Mann, operate as a gender-based economy where women serve as society's givers of feminine-coded goods and services, or put differently, social, domestic, reproductive, and emotional labor. Women are shamed or penalized for their inability or failure to fulfill this giving role, according to man. But women also experience misogyny when they are takers of masculine-coded goods, which include things like power, prestige, public recognition, rank, reputation, honor, face, respect, money, and other forms of wealth, hierarchical status, and upward mobility, and so on. So the failure of women to stick with the patriarchal script, that is, their inability to give feminine-coded goods and their appropriation of masculine-coded goods usually results to punishment. That women like Lochtef, Southern, and Stuart can obtain and project power, influence, and social prestige in their roles as, a white, as white power Barbies and trad wives reveals the source of tension. In the alt-right, their success is tolerated because of its instrumental value, but if they overreach as women, then they get punished. Now, why is this misogyny paradoxical? It is paradoxical because the better they do their job, the worse punishment they receive. Their online propaganda, which amplifies the harms of the gendered economy, is successful only if it results to more internet traffic, increased membership, and higher income. But the conditions for their success depend on claiming and flaunting masculine-coded goods in the public sphere, where money, global recognition, and success are prized. In short, Lochtef, Southern, and Stuart are in a double bind. On the one hand, they promote traditional patriarchal values and record themselves as giving, submissive, and domesticated. On the other hand, they create racist paraphernalia designed to receive public uptake, a realm that is supposed to be closed off to women from the view of the racist patriarchy. So the better these white power Barbies and trad wives perform and earn as propagandists and professional recruiters, the more justified the charge of hypocrisy and the more frequent their experience of misogyny. They pay for their success by being victimized by their own culture, the misogyny of which they are more than complicit. So, so much for bad racist girls. How can we now make sense of misogyny against conformist outright women? Manon Garcia's We Are Not Born Submissive is useful. Following Simone de Beauvoir, Garcia explains that submitting to the patriarchy or acquiescing to norms, standards, and interests antagonistic or detrimental to women's interests can be framed as a rational move. More controversially, submission can also be a source of pleasure and power, albeit a self-defeating one. So what might or how might we explain this? Beauvoir, according to Garcia, argues that the social meaning of a woman's body precedes her existence, defined as an object of male desire, love and use, and ownership. Women are socially conditioned to view themselves as a reflection of the male gaze, instead of relating to themselves as free and equal subjects, as men do. Women thus come to adopt patriarchal norms and practices to desire to be desired even before they get the chance to experience their bodies as fully their own. As Beauvoir famously puts it, and I quote, one is not born a woman, but rather becomes a woman, end of quote. Living in a patriarchal society constantly reinforces this alienation, rewarding women when they parade themselves as sexual objects and punishing them when they refuse. Now, given their ties to white men, submission makes sense for alt-right women. Their association with the most privileged social class ensures that they are better off than other groups. But their consciousness has also benefited from the successes of emancipatory social movements, like feminism. 
This modern social awareness, I argue, may help explain why intragroup misogyny feels like a betrayal to alt-right women. They expect to be treated like subjects, human beings with freedom and a full set of rights in the modern world. Their self-understanding differs from, say, the racist suffragists fighting for the right to vote in the 19th century. If we return to the cases of Olsen and the ex-member of Identity Europa, they were baffled for being disrespected. But this response only makes sense if they understand themselves as subjects and not as patriarchy's sexual objects. In the Beauvoirian analysis of the patriarchy, men do not owe women equal recognition. If a racist white woman's daughters are sexualized by a powerful white man, or if alt-right men banter about enforcing complete submission, then this is business as usual. But alt-right women are complaining because they were expecting to play a fair game. They were willing to perform a subordinative gender role for a privileged place in the alt-right utopia. So it makes sense for submissive racist women to react passively if they recognize misogyny against them as a natural part of macho racism, where all women are punching bags. But alt-right women are acting like strange bedfellows of the Me Too movement because they recognize that gender-based social injustice exists. For example, alt-right vlogger Tamara McCarthy publicly decried alt-right male trolls for harassing alt-right women like her in 2017, threatening that if alt-right men want women's support, then they should stop abusing racist women. In short, misogyny strikes good racist girls, and the paradoxical nature that this experience takes impacts them more now than it used to, thanks to the activism of feminists and social justice warriors they hate so much. Third, and finally, why am I even doing this feminist work? Some people might bat an eye about me being concerned about the misogynist abuse that alt-right women experience, especially since these women cause so much harm and oppression. Some might even say that these racists deserve or have earned the misogynist abuse that are hurled at them, but I'm not one to pass judgment on that. My take is that accounting for the misogyny hurled against women who harm other women is important. If feminist philosophy is to remain true to its aim of critically examining all forms of ideology that work against women. If we are to have a more nuanced understanding of liability and blame when it comes to women in the alt-right, then we have to do this work, even if it makes us angry and even if it makes us uncomfortable. My feminist hope is that the wounds of misogyny in the alt-right will eventually fester. And in some cases, they have. Experiences of oppression have turned the disavowal of the alt-right into a living possibility for white women, especially those victimized by their fellow hate group members, as the activist work of the organization Life After Hate has shown. But even when they don't completely break their ties with racism, abused racist women disassociate from political work. For example, while Southern still works as a conservative commentator for Australia Sky News, she has disassociated herself from the movement and even expressed some remorse, as we find in the documentary White Noise by Daniel Lombroso. So hopefully, I've convinced you to read the full essay. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>